Thanks, everybody. <laughs> what was that? Ah, God, I already heard a request. I wasn't going to play this first, but I will. It's very funny how um, I was kind of looking back at our old schedules and we used to come here to this general area so frequently in the 90s, 91, 92, 93, 94, we were always coming. And what happened? We never come here anymore. I think you guys stopped inviting us or something. Anyway, I'm hoping to change that. This is, this is day one. Thanks. Oh, what a nice room. Cool people inside of it. <laughs> Tuning it up. Tuning it up. This is an old guitar, man. I love this guitar. This is an old guitar. This guitar is from the 40s. And I have this theory. I don't know, it's probably nonsense, but that's most of my theories are. But I do have a, a strange theory. Sometimes when I play a new guitar that, like, it hasn't, dis it hasn't accepted the fact that it's not a tree anymore. <laughs> like, they're very, new guitars are kind of, you know, like, oh, like why are you putting me in this weird shape? And, Making, trying to make me make these sounds. And then what I think happens is, um, this is, I don't know. Uh, like, so, so the tree grows. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Isn't that cosmic? And, and when the tree ends its life and becomes a guitar, the, there's two things that can happen. One, the tree becomes a log, and the log, um, <laughs> the log in the fire, in my weird mind, is giving back all the energy it's soaked up from the sun. Like, that's what fire is, right? So, I mean, I'm sure that isn't what fire is, but <laughs> it's as, it makes as much sense as any other theory. You know what I mean? The, the, you know, the tree is sucking up the sun its whole life and then it sits in this like pit with rocks around it and pff, all the sun burning energy goes back off and warms us so my theory is that when the guitar is made out of the log um, after once the guitar is old enough to accept the fact that it's now a guitar and no longer a tree it then gives off its energy that it soaked up from the sun with music I want someone in the audience to go, bullshit, fucking bullshit. <laughs> but nobody, that's what I think. Thank you. Thank you to the confident bullshitter in the third row. You can be the confident bullshitter tonight. Okay, where am I? Let's see here. Oh, let me do, uh, so many songs I want to play, and I don't know what they're going to be. Oh, wow. Uh, All right, that was just a test <laughs> for this one. Now you got to know the lyrics because that's just ooh ooh and wah that you guys just sounded really good. So now you can help me because I can't do both parts at once. So. Defense, defense, defense. <laughs> you know, this is going to have to take some memorization. It's funny that you saw that. <laughs> it reminded me of. Uh, I can't get to tell this. This is a funny story. Oh, that's not that funny. I'll, I'll tell a different one. No, it's just, he just saw that at the end of that jam that I drooled. <laughs> Actually, the guys in the band used to say they were going to get me a drool cup that was like attached, like with like, like glasses. <laughs> because when the jams would get really deep, I would like lose, you know, control of my bodily functions. <laughs> so they they're like, Man, we're going to have to get you a drool cup one of these days. <laughs> I'm 
still doing it. And then when we did, oh man, we, uh, we, we in the, also in the 90s, in that era, when we used to come here all the time, we played, we played a couple of, couple of years, it seemed like, where we a warm up for Santana, um, all over the world. We went to Italy with, with Santana, and it was so cool. It was just such an exciting thing for the four of us. Everybody in the band was super nice, particularly Carlos. I, I to this day, am kind of astounded because we were, we were young and, you know, we played in some countries um, and areas of this country where nobody had any idea who we were. We were, we were just starting out. And um, he would always invite everybody to come up and jam. He would have me come up for a song every, every single night. And, and I always thought, like he had nothing to gain from this, you know? I mean, there was, he was putting on a show and, and um, it was an incredibly kind gesture that I, the older I get, the more I, I think about, you know, what a nice thing that was because we, we all learned so much from that. And one of the reasons I just thought of that was because he also pointed out once to me that I drooled. <laughs> It was really cool too. He was like, "Hey," he was like, "Yeah, that's great, man." You're like, "Do that Carlos thing that he does." He's like, "Man, you're," because <laughs> we would stand like right neck, like facing each other every single night and do these like double jams. I was like, eh. <laughs> and he was like, "Oh man, that's there. That's, <laughs> anyway, that's what made me think of that story." You guys ever drool during the jam? Somebody must. <laughs> That's our intention, you know. The whole idea behind the whole thing is, that's what we say before we come on stage. We're like, you think we can make them drool? <laughs> oh, man. Um, yeah, man. We, uh, we played here in 94. It was the last time we played in this town. Anybody, was anybody there? Is it 94 or 95? He says 95. I, I, I'm about to. But in Mesa, now hang on guys. No, I'm talking about right here. Mesa Amphitheater. Okay. No, 2000 was, was that? We're here? I don't remember 2000. <laughs> the hell happened in 2000? Once we got off stage at Big Cypress, it's all just uh, up until up until 2009. Ah, I'm going down a bad road now. Okay, one last thing. I really, I'm just playing. I'm talking too much. So let me let me just tell let me just tell this one story. Ah, uh, um, so was any, does anybody remember, we played, I think it was called the Celebrity Theater in 1993. <laughs> okay, very quickly, um, this was a special show for me, very, it was, it, as, am I right, it was like around, it's like in the, everybody's around you, and if anybody actually has been around long enough to remember that show, what was especially special about it was that, <clears throat> Um, um, is that my grandmother was there, my mother's mother, Grandma Jean, and her husband, who's a guy named Harry Jones. So I want to just very quickly tell this story because there's a, there's a meaning to it. If anyone in the room thinks that um, um, you're too old to find love or something like that, um, the story with my grandmother was that she was a fiercely independent, super cool woman who was born in Iowa, her first husband left her. She moved to New York and became an advertising executive, a single mother um, with two kids, my mom and my, in New York City in the 50s, 40s, hanging out with all, almost like Peggy and Mad Men, but she was a little higher up than that. She worked for Gray's Advertising. And she, she made an ad. She was one of the first women to ever have an ad on TV, and the ad was that the, the little drops of Prell float in the liquid. If, if you look online, you'll see it. And um, so, super cool, elegant, put together woman. Her second husband, she was married for 35 years. That was my, my grandpa, Clee. He was a painter. 
And one day, Grandma Jean came out of the shower when she was about 69 years old, and there was a note, and it said, I've left you for another woman. That was it. And off goes Klee. So Grandma Jean, uh, for about six months, was just completely devastated and shocked. And then, being the fiercely independent Grandma Jean, she just said, screw this. I'm, I'm going wild. She started trying out for TV commercials and dating all these guys. Now she was just turning 70 <laughs> at this time. And this is a beautiful, stunning, awesome, confident, cool, creative woman. And um, when she was 70, she met this guy. His name was Harry Jones. And he was like a complete catch. He was living in Kent, Connecticut. He was Lothario of Kent, Connecticut. Um, dating all the divorcees and stuff and the, you know, widowers. And she fell in love with this guy, okay? And they were, I think, 71 when this all came. They fell in love like two school children. I have n no one in my family or any of our friends had ever seen anything like it. It was, without question, the first and only time that she was in love in her life and him. And they were like eye gazing, giggling, hand holding, you know, like like puppy love from in the 70s. And that's how old she was when she found love. So when we played at the celebrity theater, they were there. And um, Harry, some of you may remember that, got up on stage and sang a song for my grandma Jean in front of the whole fish crowd. And he was like a crooner, you know, and um, I remembered all this when I pulled into town. So, so um, they had like a theme song that my grandma Jean used to sing to him when they first started dating because he was definitely like a ladies man at the time. And this is the song. I'm going to try to play this and you guys have got to forgive me because I learned this like six seconds. I, before I walked on stage. So, so I'm gonna get, you know, go with me on the spirit of it. And, uh, but she would sing this song. And the song's called, You Gotta See Mama Every Night or You Can't See Mama At All. <laughs> Michael K, Michael K. <laughs> Phoenix resident, my, my friend and guitar tech, Michael K. <laughs> Party at Michael's house tonight. <laughs> Barbecue, a couple of beers, maybe. <laughs> I just heard somebody yell out a request that I'm just thinking about whether to go for this because it's. I'm going to tell you a little secret about. The problem, the problem, we'll call it capital P, the problem. <laughs> capital P, you guys are probably wondering what the problem is. <laughs> What's the problem? Um, the problem when you have 300 songs or something like that, <laughs> is that, so these songs that we used to play more frequently. You know, we used to, they, it, just Fish and I were talking about this the other day. It's like it would never even cross our minds. They were just emblazoned in our minds. So these more complex ones, you know, we just like would burn through them. And then as time went on, we kept adding more songs and adding more songs and adding more songs until, you know, you call a song because we still have no set list or anything like we walk on stage we just i don't have one now we're making it up so occasionally now you i just heard this guy yell this out I'm gonna, i think i'm going to try it but i'm trying to think of the last time i played this so this is what happens some of the ones that really aren't that hard that it's like you're standing on stage like in a jam or something and all of a sudden it's like somebody plays something. oh it's like oh we're going to do that now and then you're kind of thinking like, like the last time I played this was like, you know, like two and a half years ago or something. And um, 
You guys are forgiving, right? Not all of you. I mean, it's getting real. I hear, I hear stuff when we screw up. Okay, I'm gonna try it. So you yelled, you yelled it, and I'm trying it. All right, we're coming back. That's it. <laughs> this is the place to be. Check this. I see, I'd like to do a couple. Ah, uh, so many. Let me do, um, you guys in a rush to get out of here? <laughs> I'm not, but they always kick me off. I, I usually leave the stage kicking and screaming. Oh, man. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Let me, do, let me see if I can. Let me, let me see if I can do this. Let me see if I can do this. I guess if I can remember this. I love this too, man, but uh, let me see. I don't know how many of you guys know this one, but. That's a funny song. It's, it's extra funny when you start playing it with an acoustic guitar. The hell am I saying? Anyway. Thanks, you guys. What a. This room. I'm gonna play this song I haven't played in a while, so. No. I felt really good singing that because I've been um, lucky enough to be hanging out here for a couple of days and looking at that. What a beautiful town! What a, that just staring at the ocean. I had a. A room with a view of the of the ocean and, and just staring and staring. It's so gorgeous. So it's nice to play that song. Lots of um... okay. <laughs> Thank you. I like that one. I like when people request songs that I like. <laughs> Got a lot of horses. Got a lot of horses around this neighborhood, right? <laughs> Neck of the woods. I thought of it because of the, the main line. I like to let the let the main flow. Um, got a lot, a lot of horses around here, right? <laughs> Somebody told me that. I'll do a finger picking song because. Someone also told me that, you may already know this, but I just heard this, and it kind of is messing with my head, but somebody told me that horses' legs are like fingers. The anatomy of the horse's legs are fingers, and that the hoof is like a fingernail. Did you know that? that I'm not kidding. This is, sounds like something I'm making up, but it's, it's, it's completely true. Somebody back me up, please, on this. You guys think I'm just... The horse's legs are the horse's fingers. Anatomically speaking, correct? Any horse people out there? Somebody, please. And uh, the hooves are like fingernails. Which is really gross. I mean, it's horrible. The beautiful, stunning animals. But ever since I heard that, I haven't been able to stop thinking about it. And I especially think about it whenever I'm finger picking on the guitar. <laughs> it's like, like a horse running over the, over the neck of the guitar, which I will now do for you. So just enjoy the music. Don't picture my hand and think it's a horse. I <laughs> 
can't do it. I can't play it. <laughs> it's kind of a trot, right? Yeah. Sorry, I started thinking about another horse thing. <laughs> I won't keep talking about horses all night. If a, if a, if, if, if the horse, <laughs> if the horse falls and breaks his leg in the Kentucky Derby, he gets shot, which is very sad. I think that's what happens. And if the horse wins, he gets to fornicate. <laughs> yeah, you guys, you think I'm making this up again? This is like the... If the horse falls and breaks his leg, he gets shot. And if he wins, he gets to fornicate. True? That's tough. That's a tough race. <laughs> I'm gonna play a bunch of songs you know, without saying anything stupid like that. Okay. Man, I'm gonna dedicate this to, uh, this is not to be, this is not to be morbid, this is to be with love. Uh, that one of my best friends uh, has been, uh, uh, um, uh, um, it, what, uh, ushering his father into the, um, and, uh, away from our plane of existence. And um, he just texted me right when I was walking on stage. This is my friend, Captain Kevin. He's a guy who's actually co-written some songs with me. And also there's some fish songs that he's involved in. So he's kind of a member of our family. And he just texted me. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna play this song. Kevin, if you're out there, because I think you might be listening. This is uh, for you, in honor of your dad. And I loved your dad, he's a good friend of mine. So here we go. See how this works. So just thought of another one that I have, I have, a, I have a, a big, that every song, I have a, a problem with that. <laughs> My problem is that, is the, that, 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 that the disease of addiction has wreaked havoc on my life. And my addiction is songwriting. Because <laughs> I have way too many songs. And they just keep piling up. It's a good addiction to have. It's worse. Let me, let me, oh, I'll do that one, yeah. Okay, I heard a couple of those. Hang on a second. I gotta do a little more horse, a little more horseback riding. Because, you know why? Because I want to win. Tonight. One, one word too many. <laughs> Just thinking about this um I mean I'm gonna play this song um this popped into my head but but I talked about the song it's this kind of I wrote this right right like um um probably like a month after Coventry, I think. And uh, I, it's such a mixed up time. And, and um, uh, um, um, this is like a, a weirdly optimistic song that, that you know, uh, I was, what happened was I was flying down to Atlanta to do some. Oh, God, all I have to do to get a cheer is like say a town name. So I'm in Cleveland. <laughs> so easy. I thought I had to like play well or do you know. anyway. No, but I uh, I was taken off on the plane, and so like and you know sometimes when you go up in the air, you know you get like the perspective. Suddenly you're you you know it's like embroiled in massive problems and, 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 and on the ground. <laughs> and then you're kind of busting through the rainy, misty clouds and then 
what, you know, I saw the sun coming up. We've all done it. You know, the sun's coming up over the horizon and it's like the morning and, and I was looking at all these lines on the ground, you know, like when you look out the window of the plane and you start to see, you know, how insignificant and small everything is. And you kind of get a dose of perspective for a minute. And <clears throat> so, you know, like the first line of this song was trying to address, you know, straight on the problem that we were having, you know, me and like everybody else in the scene at that time, which had been like completely taken over by like the dark, you know, the dark side. And um, um, we were trying to fix that for a couple of years and it was really hard to fix, you know? And, and so, you know, we were basically stopping trying to address this, but I still had this massive amount of hope that, okay, we're gonna, you know, we're still, even after Coventry and when we stopped, I just, I knew you know, that I love my friends and that we were gonna like get over this somehow. It wasn't gonna be easy and, um, I mean, that turned out to be true, but I don't think I was ready, I, was, I couldn't really anticipate the sort of like, you know, backlashy kind of like feelings that I was like, uh, you know, it was pretty intense for a couple of years. But anyway, for a minute, while I was taken off on this plane, I wrote this song very quickly, which I will now play. and. Um, um, I think now that there's some like time that's gone by, it's kind of easier to, maybe it might have not, you know, to play it. But uh, if the, you, now that I've said that, maybe some of the song, line references about the lines on the ground and the and going through water and, and you know surfing through the air, which is what it felt like, you know, in the in the plane, might make a little bit more sense. But we'll see. I'll give it a whack. Oh man, we're all here. <laughs> Which is enough, which is enough for me. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, it's funny, Ella Fitzgerald used to say that when she walked on stage, which I've heard and it's such a beautiful sentiment. I always thought that was such a cool thing to say. She used to always walk on a stage and say, we're all here. And we are all here. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. Man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna play it. I'm gonna play it. Don't worry. I, I, something about saying cheap date just reminded me of, of this, um, of uh, being here and I, I, so many good times in, in LA. But this one, oh man, I can't, I can't tell. This story is too weird. But I'm gonna, I'll tell it. I'll tell it. Listen, you know, you know, you know. First, full. I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus here or anything. Uh, when I tell you this, you're going to think like, what the hell is he talking about? But I learned something when, when, when we were doing Hoist, right? We lived in, was it when we were doing Hoist? Might have been a different time. Um, we lived here when we were doing Hoist, but um, this ex experience might have been a little later than that. I, I found out something about the L.A. party scene that was very fascinating to me that I didn't know when we were out here. And, and, and because, I don't know, Fish was playing it someplace and subsequently by our like you know like you know d list or like l list or m list celebrity status we got invited to this party that was like a it was like a um like a young hollywood party okay you guys know what i'm getting at so it was like fabulous people like young fabulous people and then us <laughs> So, we go to this party, right? And uh, I never knew how any of this worked. Like, but, so we get there, and there's somebody there at these parties. They have like a party planner with a, with a clipboard, right? And um, I was actually with my friend Brad, our old road manager, who's in the audience. Hi, Brad. <laughs> so he's gonna remember this night very fondly. <laughs> but anyway, so we go in, and, um, and they kind of grab me and, they, and I guess what happens at these parties is that like when you see pictures in like People Magazine and stuff of like celebrities having fun together, it's like planned. And um, so I never knew that, you know? <laughs> and I, so I go in and they kind of grab me and they, you know, Brad never had to go. And there's a party, it's a real party, but inside the party there's like a roped off area, right? And it's sort of like the photo fun area 
<laughs> so you, this, this is all true. So you go in and they have your name on the list. Oh, he's the guy from Fish, and I could tell she didn't actually know like who I was at all. But it's like, all right, put him in with the famous people. So I go into this like, like corral in the middle of the party, right? And there's a couch, okay? And and what you're supposed to do is like casually sit on the couch and like. You know, look at each other and laugh and shit. And like you're having a great time and then they take your photo and it ends up in like TMZ or something like that. Like I said, oh, we saw these people hanging out together. So I go in there, I didn't know what to do. And they, they kind of pushed me into the corral and then everybody else had to sort of stay on the outside, like the gang that we showed up with. I don't know, they put me in there. And at the time, the people who were, I think were most famous at the time, and this is where I'm, I'm not saying anything mean, I'm just stating facts. So it was like kind of like Paris Hilton era, right? In her, in her heyday. So I went in, and Paris Hilton was in there. And <laughs> she's like sitting on the couch. And there's like a couple of guys next to her who are so like cool looking, put together, like with a hat. <laughs> They're like looking really cool. Like, like my, you know, you know, my D set Pat Mac t shirt or whatever. And, uh, and the woman goes, Yeah, sit down, sit there, there on the couch. So like, I go to sit down on the couch, and then Paris, you know, kind of got up, <laughs> and she's like, I'm not sitting on the couch next to that guy. <laughs> That's a true story. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I mean, you know, you know, she's, she like kind of threw a, like, there's no way I'm sitting next to that guy on the couch. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, what do you want me to do? <laughs> So then, this is the funny part. So then, Nicole Richie was also there. And she was like, I'll sit next to you on the couch. <laughs> I'm not making this up. This is 100% factual. So she was very nice and sat next to me on the couch. And that's the Hollywood story. I'm sure that Paris is a very lovely person. <laughs> and I totally understand why she didn't want to sit me next to me on the couch. So. <laughs> anyway, uh, what song was I playing here? Yes. Man, Tom and I uh, wrote that song and also that first one that I played, Secret Smile, at the same, on the same songwriting trip. And it was very interesting when I play those songs now. You know, our kids are like, um, my kids are 21 and 23 now, and at the time they were, thank you, they, they just grow, they do it, I didn't do anything. <laughs> they just, it's crazy. But I'll take the clap anyway. <laughs> but they, um, it just makes me sad with the two, you know, that, that feeling was so profound at the time of like, you know, having the home life and traveling a lot with the band and I don't know how many of you guys have little kids, but kind of like, whoosh, it goes, goes fast. And, and um, one, um, not too long ago, my, I was walking down the street with Sue and my wife Sue and my older daughter, who's 23, her name's Eliza, and she, she said to Sue, um, she said, one day you put me down and you never pick me up again. <laughs> I really, like, I kind of thought, whoa. <laughs> so if you have little kids and you're in the audience and you're still carrying them around, think about that for a minute. <laughs> if you're like, oh, I got to get them out of the car again and they're so heavy and it's hurting my back. Don't worry. <laughs> it won't be long. So let me, um, I'm going to do that. Yeah, so thank you. Let's see if I can. So this way. Oh, 31st anniversary. Oh, you're here. Oh. Okay, I will dedicate this to your parents who are right here. I can't see you. Are you? Where are you? Put your hand up there so I can see you. Oh, there you are. All right. Um, I'm gonna dedicate this to your 31st anniversary. Happy anniversary. I'm glad you. Okay.
I'm going to dedicate this um, real quick. I'm going to play this song. Um, thanks, Michael. I'm going to dedicate this to uh, my grandfather. Um, I'm, you know, my, I'm, I'm the third, so which makes the, the tray thing comes from. I am Ernest Joseph Anastasio the third. And uh, my father's in the audience tonight. Hi, Dad. <laughs> Number two, and my grandfather was, of course, number one. He's, I used to call him Grandpoony. We were very close. So Grandpoony, Ernest number one, was a, um, um, he's an immigrant. He was born in Italy, in Amalfi, Italy. Um, came over here and, and settled in New Haven. Um, I love that now. All you gotta do is name a town, any town, you get a cheer. <laughs> I gotta remember that, like for a night when everything's going horribly wrong. Just be like, um, uh, Pittsburgh! Yeah! <laughs> yeah, <some. laughs> uh, so, my grandfather was a big music fan, and I remember being a child in his house, my grandparents' house, my grandmother would be cooking dinner. And um, he was an amazing cook, um, Italian cook. And um, we'd all be kind of playing in the living room. My grandfather used to play me classical records, and he was a big classical fan. Um, and um, had a great record collection. He and my great uncle Tom, his brother, had um, light, lifetime season tickets to Sprague Hall where they would see the symphony in New Haven. Um, and he would always play me stuff. He liked Rachman and often more serious stuff. Anyway, the reason I'm telling this story is because he would have been absolutely thrilled to, to know that, that I was playing music in this beautiful room. <laughs> um, and so I want to send this out to you, Grand Pony, in the, in the spirit, your spirit. And, um, Grandpa, uh, he, he liked the serious stuff. He liked a little sadder stuff. He used to kind of, I remember standing with him by the record player and he kind of would um, make fun of my grandmother, Grandma Mooney, <laughs> uh, because like she liked Mozart, which was light, you know? But he liked Rock, Rachmaninoff and you know, he didn't like anything that like was like, you know, light. You know? So I think he might have he might have liked this one. <laughs> Nah, I was playing that like I was drunk. Appropriately. Okay. Yes. Nope. Nope. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you. You guys want me to play all these complicated songs? All right, I'll, I'll try one that's kind of complicated. But I'm not playing that one, but let me let me see. You guys want to see me struggle. I know what you're after. Okay, I'll play one I like that. I don't, we'll see how, if it's unplayable on the acoustic guitar, but I don't think so, but we'll see. Oh, man. <laughs> Let me do it. Uh, ah, ah, whoa, hey. I'm getting confused. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, you guys, for all these lovely requests. Um, I have to tell you one more quick story, and then I'm going to. This just popped in my head too. You guys know the, um, you know the, the hoist cover with a horse. <laughs> I hate that cover, so I'm gonna like admit that now <laughs> because it's right down the road from where we recorded that album um, at American Recording Studios. We had the best time. We we moved here, the four of us, and we lived like right down the street from the Viper Room, 
during that, that, they wouldn't let us in. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding, but we did walk past it. Back. <laughs> but we played, oh man, oh, oh, let me play this one. Hold on. Um, yeah, we had such a good time doing that album. No, I just remembered another, I'll tell you about the cover and I'll do this and I'll play this song. So the cover was, we were doing this album and we were, some of it was really taken off, like, particularly like we were thinking like the outro of, of, of um, Julius with the horn section, we had the power, Tower of Power in there and everything was just, and we, we started coming up as we often do with these like grandiose ideas, we're like, oh my God, we're gonna, this music is, you know, like, it, it's so powerful that it, like, <laughs> It feels like it's like you can levitate, you know what I mean? Like, it, it, it's like, it's making me feel like, like my feet are leaving the ground, and then there's the line, and if I could, was this on the album, you know? I want to feel my feet leave the ground, and like, we should, we should um, do a cover where the most grounded of creatures <laughs> is like, <laughs> lifting like, you know, like just slightly. <laughs> into the air and we're like wait a minute what, what, like, what about a horse because they're so they're so and then we're like yeah it'll be just like floating like just a little and, and it'll you know that it'll be called I don't know what the album's going to be called but it was this concept and we, we get a photographer and we got this cool photographer who was going to do it and then we're like where do we find a horse and and our friend Amy who where our first festival was at a place called Amy's Farm, right? She you guys, some of you know about. And our friend Amy had horses, and she was hanging around. She's like, oh, I have a horse. I have this horse, Maggie. And uh, come to my farm. So we went to take this picture. We brought the photographer. <laughs> and she, she had this contraption that, you know, Maggie had been in before, and no, no animals were harmed in this story. <laughs> but, you know, she strapped Maggie into this thing and like horribly like lifted her off the ground like Ugh! like when the back is curving and it's, it's like nothing like we had nothing like we had <laughs> conceived of it all it's just like a horse in a horrible contraption <laughs> you know just, this beautiful like ethereal thing was diminished to a ugh. And then they took the picture, and then this is the same thing that happened. So many, the same thing with Billy Breeze here. It's like we were out of time, and they needed the cover tomorrow, and it cost too much money, and that's it. That's the cover. So, <laughs> you know, we're stuck with this thing. And then we didn't have a name. We were like, I'll just call it Hoist, you know, because it's going up in this, just like a nightmare. That's the story of that cover. And then there actually, if you look inside, there's a picture of the four guys sort of dressed as like carnival. We're like in carnival kind of clothes. And Fish was like holding this weight up above his head like he's a weightlifter, like a striped. And he's kind of leaning back and he's like going. And, and there's a lot of visual of his like private bits and pieces are kind of accentuated based on his leaning back. So I thought we should have just put that on the cover and called it Hung Like a Horse. <laughs> Much better. Uh, no. Hoist. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> there you go. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Here you go. I'm going to do this one. I like this one. But um, this is another song from the album. So this one was my favorite part of making that album. And I will stop talking so much, but then play some music. But um, on the outro of this tune, um, we, it's like a funky kind of tune and it had the funky vocals. And we were like, man, I wonder if Rose Stone from Sly and the Family Stone still lives in LA. Um, you know, um, I will say that like when I was a kid, my dad's in the audience. Um, um, I used to look at all those covers. They, my parents were very young. 21, 20, 20, 22, when I, when I was born. And um, so I was, you know, was born in 1964, and, you know, it was like 1971, and I was a kid, and there were parties at the house, and there was always a lot of Sly and the Family Stone playing. And I used to look at these covers, you know, 
these Sly and the Family Stone covers, and there'd be like men and women and black and white and, and singing these songs about like, you know, family affair and all this positive stuff. And I was a kid, and I always wanted to have a band like that. And I, I actually ended up kind of modeling Tab after that, you know, old and young and Hispanic and black and white and, and you know, and, and everybody to get men and women um, and horns and all that stuff. And anyway, you know, so we're doing, this is some, um, we, we wondered in the middle of this recording if Rose Stone, who was, you know, Sly's sister who sang all that stuff. And so we called and she answered the phone and said she would come sing on the record. So if you go back and you listen to this song, um, she came in and gave us like a soul lesson. Um, it was incredible, incredible thing to hear. So, um, <clears throat> And if you go back and listen to the album version of this closely, you will hear the same person who did. She told me that she made the sound like this. It's a family affair. You know, like with her hands. And then she came in, sat on this stool, and I had a microphone, and she had a microphone, and we sang the outro to this. So I'll do it now. And you got to imagine Sly's sister singing this. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Beautiful, ornate. Well, I couldn't hear what you said, but you yelled something. The voice sounds lovely. Whoever just yelled, but I was just thinking about that song um, when Tom and I were writing it. Um, we had a big debate over one word. This is not that interesting, but it popped into my head. Um, you know, it's supposed to be about being able to, like, having a dream and being able to. to you know, be on that perfect line where you're, where you're, you know, you, you still see it, but you can't hold on to it. Um, this is not going to work, this story. <laughs> I should just tell Peyton Hooten and get it over with. <laughs> ah! Hello. Hi, everybody. What are you doing up there? Hey. You guys sick of kale yet? Anybody else other than me? Sick of fucking kale? You guys sick of kale? Because I am. Anyway, that's much more interesting. My hatred of kale. <laughs> Fuck kale. <laughs> Fucking kale. Right? <laughs> Fucking kale. <laughs> oh, <let me> know. <laughs> okay. It's so great being here. for so long and I just hello <laughs> so sorry so interesting that I do this like from room to room you know and and um, more so than with the electric stuff like the sound of the rooms are different and the energy of the rooms are really different than so like, thank you Don't, I'm not asking for anything there just be yourselves <laughs> I just like making a point. <laughs> like if I start whispering, it might be because you guys are like three feet further away than last night. So I'll speak more. Um. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, have any of you guys been coming around since um, like the early 90s? Is there anybody out there that... Do you guys remember this? I just remember this because sometimes I think like when I come out west, I always remember, sometimes I can look out the plane, the window of the plane, and I remember driving out here, you know, in 19, I don't know, 80, Eight, eighty-nine. Like you know, it, we used to have a car. The four of us had a had a had a car that we drove in, and um, we would play these little clubs and stuff like that. But there was always all these adventures that we would have. And part of the thing that really dawns on me, I was just thinking about it yesterday, <coughs> was that like I was playing down in L.A. and I remember that when we were in L.A. and I think in 1989 we got robbed. Right, the, we came out of the of the venue and our car had been robbed. And the thing that was interesting about it was that like, we didn't have cell phones or anything. So 
And the feeling, it really strikes me now that the feeling was that you were like a, like a million miles away from, you know, our home in the East Coast, like going on tour was this like, like adventure. Whereas today, I mean, I'm not trying to, I sound like some old guy on a chair with a guitar. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like when we got robbed, there was, you know, there wasn't, you couldn't like call anybody for help or anything. You had to, I don't know, flag a cop or I don't know what, we, it's just, uh, you know, things have changed. But, but that kind of got me thinking about some of those gigs. And the reason I asked if anybody's around in 91, because I suddenly remembered this thing we used to do that um, this is going to amaze me if anyone in the room remembers this. But um, I was sitting backstage one, one night trying to teach those guys It's Ice, right? So I was going. And what would happen was the songs in that era were so complex, right? That I would inevitably mess up because it, and I'm trying to teach these guys, so I'd go, I'd go. Oh, wait. And I'd say, wait, right? And, and they would laugh because I always did that. And they're like, oh, you always do that. And then you say, wait. And then I would do it again, you know. Oh, wait. And then they said, wait. Okay? So then we'd have this thing with like, there's no line in between the backstage and the stage. So we thought it was so, we were like laughing so hard at this stupid thing that we thought everybody at the show would think this was equally funny, right? <laughs> So we got into this thing, it started to have a name, it's called The Wait. And we'd like go on stage, we'd like, let's do The Wait. Right, we'd look at each other like, ha, 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 we're gonna do The Wait. <laughs> and uh, so we'd go, like all four of us would go. Wait, and the, at simultaneously we'd say, wait. And then, and then we'd do it again. And then again, and then again, and then again, and again. And, people would kind of like stare at us, you know what I mean? And the weirder it got, the funnier we thought it was. So I remember getting to the point, we were in Colorado at one point, I, I swear to you, as I stand here today, we did it for like 15 minutes. And then it got to the point where the whole crowd, even though it was a small like, kind of like, it was like a frat party or something. Like that, you know, and we'd, we'd start going, we were going. And they'd go, fuck you, they'd like, fuck you, they'd chant like screaming. And then that would make us want to do it even longer. So we were just like, who could, you know, like last out longer? And I remember one time, this dude had like a big, one of those big red beers, and he just threw it at fish, like, beesh, like on the weight. And just beer all over the drums. And Anyway, were any of you at that? <laughs> Ah, none of you were, were you? So, next time you're like, I've been to 300 shows, man. <laughs> yeah, but you haven't been to the wait. You never saw the wait. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> next, time, next time you see Paige or Mike, ask him about it, though. Paige really got a kick out of that one. <laughs> uh, good singers. Good singers. I thought, like, you know, since so many people work, like, I'm sure a lot of people out here work in the, you know, tech programming, right? It's, that you guys would probably be more like, more than coming to a concert singing, you'd probably be more interested in, like, Goat Simulator and things like that. <laughs> ah! A couple of people laughed. You gave yourselves away. <laughs> I see that sign, but I can't do that one yet. <laughs> I could do a different one of those. But, um, thanks. All right, man. Let me try. You guys like Goat Simulator? Nobody else? I love Goat Simulator. I just threw that in to see if anybody else liked it. Sorry, I like Goat Simulator. You know what Goat Simulator is? I can't, I'm not telling you, ask somebody. It's a video game.
It's the greatest video game ever invented. I mean, it has no purpose whatsoever. You're basically a goat, and you, you just smash stuff. You, you go through a town causing, causing mayhem wherever you go, which I can relate to that in some strange. <laughs> travel around wrecking stuff and leaving a trail of Trail of horror in your wake, in your, in your awful wake. Thirty-four year old. Hello. <laughs> All right, man. I gotta get serious. <laughs> Let me see if I can get. I already forgot what you just said. Like, one second ago. How quickly I forgot. <laughs> Don't forget, go ahead. Um, we used to come here in like 1991. And 92 and 93. It's so, I love pulling into this town. And 94. And I think we came here in 2014, but we don't, we, I don't know what happened, man. We used to come here all the time. You couldn't get rid of us, or me, us meeting, you know, me and my duologue, you know, my, my inner voice. list. You guys ever make a gratitude list? It's great. It's a great way to start the day. And I wrote down my pen and like the first thing I could think of <laughs> was that I was glad that I wasn't Joe Pesci in casino digging my own grave and getting <laughs> beaten to death with a, with a baseball bat and having to lay on top of my brother. And that was pretty much it. Like from there I just thought it's, it's all, it's all cake after that. <laughs> um, you know, I'll tell you a funny thing about Eugene um, in, in 91. We used to play at the Hilton Ballroom. Does that still exist? Does it exist? I, 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 I kind of want to go look at it to see... I don't know if anybody was there. Was anybody there? No, we got to be pretty old. Right? But um, I remember we, we played a gig at the Hilton Ballroom, and I think just to screw with them, I started yelling out Fish's room number, because we, we would stay in the hotel, like do the gig, and then just go upstairs. So the whole gig, I think I was like, and then there's John Fishman, room 623. Party in his room. And everybody went running up there afterwards. Being a good sport, he, he had a party. He was having a party the entire venue. Just, it was Just a pretty crazy fun night. One of the most fun nights that night, the party in 623. It's, a, it's legendary in, in this area. Run into people in bars and stuff. I was like, man, I was in room 623. I couldn't believe what it was like in there. It was crazy. Fish man in the dress. It's like, again, I just got to see him with his dress off again. Like, I gotta play some. Actually, <laughs> sorry. I start thinking about this stuff. I'm like, I was just thinking that it was, it was not the most epic night ever. Which I was remembering the other day. The most epic night ever was 
in actually in the, in the New York area when I went to this club. <laughs> this whole tour, this has been having, I'm, I'm realizing that all I have to do is say any city name, any city name, it's an automatic woo. It's the cheapest woo in show business. Georgia. <laughs> no, but there was this one night in New York we went to um, like this, I think it was like Grammy party or something, and I ended up hanging out with Nelly. You guys, <laughs> this is true. I'm not making this up. It was the most random, crazy thing. There's actually a picture online. If you look online, you can find a picture from that night but it was in the kind of mellower part of the night. So if you do happen to Google that picture, a lot of people ask me, um, you know, what was that night like? <laughs> and the only thing I can come up with is, I don't know if you've ever seen the video for, it's getting hot in here, you know that video? <laughs> it's getting hot in here, right? So like, just picture that video, or watch that video when you go home. A picture exactly like that, but with me in the middle. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much what happened. Except it wasn't just three and a half minutes long. I was like, oh, all night long. All night long. Just last thing, it was a guy, it was over there. You said I was not supposed to forget something. Mercury! Did you say? Mercury! Oh, Mercury, okay, I know that. I think it's like Billy Green's, but... I gotta get my finger picky warmed up. You know, I've learned i learned to um, surf near here, which is kind of a strange thing. But I guess people surf. Uh, we had a friend who used to travel around. His name was Pete Kennedy. He was a he was a pro surfer. And back in the 90s when we would drive around early. He was always trying to get us to surf and you know with with a lot of the distance most of the time because it's cold. <laughs> it's cold water, it's cold. But he right up around here he taught me how to surf. And uh, it was so cool. Uh, he, he did get me to my you know I don't know if you guys have ever done it, but he got me to do the wetsuits and all that stuff. And, and um, Never forget it. I will never, if you've never done it, I recommend get out there and um, you can just go right over there, get your wetsuit. It's freezing cold. And I think it's rare that there's a couple of sharks. I think there's sharks up here because I remember asking about it. You guys and he said they, they don't really eat you, they just bite. <laughs> I remember that. Sharks just bite, they don't really eat you. Oh, okay. All right then. Just. <laughs> and I think of the weirdest thing, these songs are so. That song was, um, Tom and I wrote that song, and my beautiful friend Tom Marshall, let's, let's do it. <laughs> but, uh, love him, and we, at the, in the, for a while there, after we both got married and had kids and everything, we, we always used to write songs together, and then we kind of 
lived in two different states, we were far apart. So what happened was, um, asked Tom to make a book of all his ramblings and jottings and stuff like that. Just, he basically went to Kinko's and found all this stuff um, into a big book, and I had it, and I used to write these songs. Sometimes I would like pull one line out of a poem that I really liked and like write a song around it. Other times I would use one verse and then put like, it was free flowing. That last song was written um, <laughs> that way, and it was written, I, it always kind of makes me misty because it was written about two days before my first daughter was born. Um, <laughs> Eliza, and she's 23 now, working, and you know, it's crazy to think how fast all this goes by, and, and I wrote that, Sue was, uh, my wife was, Sue was on the, on the bed, she's like really pregnant, huge, and it was two o'clock in the morning, and I was like sitting on the floor, you know, I used to kind of have to, I, I, I guess I, and uh, so I, I kind of think back about it, these things, and, playing, and another thing just popped into my mind that was crazy was that when we were here in 92, I think it was like April or something, we, and we went that summer, we, we left here, we went to Europe that summer, um, right from, we were touring so much, driving around in a car and stuff, it was just so fun coming up to this part of the country. Um, and we went to Europe, we played at this festival, um, it's called Raskilda, which is a festival in Denmark, and um, it was, we played early in the day, and, and, and the headliner was Nirvana, and they were like right in the, like the peak, like, it was like the peak week of their, of their power. Uh, I'm not kidding, uh, it was right, it just like that, like while this thing was just blowing up, she's so huge, and um, we played, and they were gonna play later, and we played at this festival in Denmark, and um, We met this weird band called Cosmod Box. <laughs> they were like on the third stage. It all comes together. <laughs> Cosmod Box. Cosmod Box. That's all I'm going to say. You figure the rest out. <laughs> there, there was more to that story, but I'm not going to worry about it. Alright, I'm playing some more tunes here. Beautiful room. Did you guys see the uh, paintings on the wall, on the root, on the ceiling, and all that stuff? You know? um, I wanted to play that song, and I want to play this next song as we start the night. To I was thinking when I was backstage, you know, I'm very, very, very lucky to be part of a community of people that I in our little music world that around the band, I, I feel like a member of a beautiful community of friends. And tonight I'm here in this lovely town with you guys and people who live in this area. My, one of my um, best friends lived in a couple hours from here. And I just wanted to say that when all this stuff was happening, I, I want to start off the night by just saying, when all this stuff was happening with these fires and stuff, we were all sending our love and our hearts are with everybody who suffered through that. And um, I was, <laughs> um, it made me really happy that I kind of thought for a minute that the gig was gonna get canceled and it didn't. 
Um, and that made me incredibly happy because I love playing here today. And I want to send this one out. I wrote this right after I went through a hard time thinking that um, some other people might need this sentiment. So I will play this one. And then we'll keep going on with a great night and some music. So, just adjust this a little bit. Man, I really wanted to sing that because I was driving up here. From, I drove down from... Uh, Oh my God, I literally could not remember where I was. Thank you. Ah. See, this must, that must be a, like, a, like a brain remnant from when I wrote that song about the soaring far too high stuff. And it, no, I, I couldn't remember where I was last night. Thank you. I guess it doesn't remember that. <laughs> But I was driving down the, the drive from, oh, okay, I'll play that. But let me tell the story. First. But um, the drive down from uh, Eugene is beautiful. Eugene. I've actually been discovering on this tour that if you say in the name of any town, you get an automatic cheer. So I said, Eugene. Thank you. Um, no, but it's beautiful. I'm just saying, I know you guys know because you live here, but the mountains were. I was trying to take a picture of it, and my it wouldn't register, but it's just beautiful. The clouds over the mountains, and it's just this curving through, just stunning, beautiful, beautiful countryside around here. Uh, very blessed to be living in such a, such a, like, heaven on earth spot. So that was the appropriate song. And then I was backstage, and they were um, telling me that you guys do a lot of kayak kayaking, water kayaking, stuff like that. Kayaking? Any kayakers? Kayaker? No kayakers here? No kayakers? I like to diminish it to one syllable, kayak. 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 That'd be much better. Much better way. I am not making this up. The most horrific thing that ever happened to me in my entire life, I was in a cack. And <laughs> it was, we were at, uh, we were at, in Burlington, Lake Champlain, at this like, you know, party on the, on the beach. It was like, you know, just daytime, afternoon, barbecue-y kind of thing with all kinds of friends. And, and um, I remember this, and, and um, you know, it was like, uh, you know, some music and really mellow, just mellow, with a couple of beers and just some friends hanging out. And there was this like super safe, like beginner's kayak that, you know, like with like padding all over it and where, you know, you couldn't. And, and I wanted to try this thing <laughs> and I remember I got in it and I was like, I, in a, like a foot and a half of water right by the shore, very shallow, two feet of water. And it flipped over. And um, I was upside down, and I didn't know how to get out of this thing, and nobody like taught me. And I remember like panicking so hard, just I couldn't breathe, like you know, like ah! Oh! And, and, and then the funny part about it was that in my mind, everyone was coming to rescue me, right? <laughs> you know, like the, the whole beach was was you know in on the emergency that was happening. That I mean, I must have been down there for like a minute and a half. I couldn't breathe. And then I was sure I was going to die, and I'm pushing on the ground. I, I couldn't get this thing back up, and and I finally flipped it back up. And I remember just my to to my great disappointment, <laughs> that, like no one had noticed this, <laughs> you know, like at all. <laughs> it must have been some kind of spiritual metaphor, but I mean, I was this close to death, and I was sure that it was the biggest deal to everyone else standing on the beach, but. <laughs> Nobody cared at all, as long as the beer kept flowing and the music was playing. Uh, and I do have to wonder, as the years go by, how long I would have hung there upside down before somebody noticed. But death don't hurt very long, so it would have been... I'm not saying that. All right, man. Let me do this, because I like... I'm not, I'm not gonna... I am not gonna lie here. This is real um, filling my heart to play in such a beautiful, quiet sounding room like this. Um, it's rare and thank you um, for being here.
guys want to know what that song's about, or should I just get Or is that going to ruin it for you? You probably got your own image in your mind. We played a show once this is, that was uh, at, uh, on this flatbed truck. We used to play these parties a lot. When Fish started, we were, we were basically a party band. Um, unlike now. <laughs> <laughs> like when we started, like everybody's having tons of fun, like raging. And, uh, I don't know what happened, man. We're still having fun. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> but no, we used to, we kind of like played more parties than, than you know, um, gigs, whatever. And then we were playing this flat, on a flatbed truck, and this is pretty early on, probably early to mid 80s, and all the people in that song are, well, there was this friend of ours, his name was Daniel, my, Daniel, my brother we call him, his name was Daniel, he had, he had a, like real long hair, he's a real mountain man, um, Vermont, you know, and long hair and like big beard, he had a, he had a, we had a walrus mustache, right? And, um, um, he was, a, he was a super cool guy. He, 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 built a, he built his house out of like scraps, like scrap, you know, and lived off the land and you know, one of these kind of super, he would come to all our gigs. He was like one of our close friends. And he had this dog named Lucy, right? <laughs> Beautiful dog. And <laughs> this, is a, this story's gonna freak people out, but it's, I, I, don't know, I thought it was, but, uh, and you know, I remember playing at this flatbed truck and in a field, you know, and everybody's like dancing around, and it's partying, and it was, we'd play for hours and hours. And um, Daniel was there, and one time he came, and Lucy had this horrible growth out of, out of her head. Uh, this isn't funny, this is like, I'm making it funny, because I, but, uh, but anyway, um, and he said that Lucy had cancer, which is this dog that we had known for a while, and he had a, Daniel, because this is the kind of guy, one of the things Daniel used to say is he said, when, I, when I'm 50, I'm going to do 50 push-ups. I always thought that was cool. Like, he, he, he was like, he was like a, you know, he said, he, you know, I'm going to do 50 push-ups at 50. This thing, walrus mustache, there's a secret place. I saw it when I met him. <laughs> right? <laughs> the walrus on your face. <laughs> I told me it was a secret place. I saw it when I met you. The walrus on your face. And um, my dog was there, Marley, the, who was, used to travel with Marley and, and, and Lucy used to, were friends. And then this, this guy, Aguila, who, who, who was like a, like a witch, like a male witch or something. He had all black clothes and he would walk around Burlington. Everybody's kind of scared of him. He'd like walk on the, and he had a ferret. He always had a ferret in his, like, in his clothing. Weird, man. And he had like black, you know, all black and Aguila. And it was like, oh my God, there's Aguila on the other side of the street. You'd be like, whoa. And Aguila scared the shit out of the ram because Marley was called the ram. Like, like Aguila would come into, into view. This was all going on at these parties. This was like the crew that used to come see us. So you, Marley would start going like, whoa, 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 whoa. And I was like, oh, Aguila's here. And like Aguila would be way over there. And uh, Marley would just go haywire. And then Marley would hang out with Lucy, who, you know, Lucy was Marley's pal, but this one day we were at the flatbread truck and Lucy had a lump, a big lump. And Daniel had a gun. This is where it gets. <laughs> and he like came walking up to us, to the stage, the stage. It wasn't a stage, it was like a, you know, like a pickup truck with a, and, <laughs> and, and I'm like, Daniel, like, what are you doing with that gun, man? And he's like, he said, he said, Lucy had cancer, but he said, he said, a, a man needs to shoot his own dog. And that's because, you know, he's like, and then he, he walked, he turned and walked into the woods with Lucy. But, I, I know, that's a horrible story. I'm sorry. That's a, that was the end of Lucy. Lucy took a walk. Now Lucy's dead. <laughs> That's the last words that Lucy ever heard. It was a man needs to shoot his own dog. <laughs> At the same time, come on, man. 
That's kind of cool. <laughs> I mean, I, I really admired Daniel about a lot of things. That's just the kind of, that's the way he looked at life, you know? He, he's probably out there. I don't know if these stories go. I forgot about that internet. Anyway, it's good. Put it on. But Daniel, if you hear this, I love you, man. Like, I, I thought, let me tell you something. Just to get Daniel off the hook. So he's on the hook. He's not even on the hook. There's no hook. But <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> What's the hook? But, but this is like a guy who, like, like I said, he built his house out of, like, you know, like, windows that were like broken and thrown in the dumpster he'd like the coolest house is all made out of windows and shit and like you know i said 50 push-ups when he's 50 a man needs to shoot his own dog <laughs> like he didn't think that he should bring it to the vet where lucy would have been unhappy so he probably went out and he was like you know oh lucy look at the look at the nice <laughs> <laughs> Tell you, man. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's kind of right in a certain way, but I brought my dog to the vet. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> anyway, that's what that song's about. <laughs> There's more than that. I could. Tell, I could tell 50 stories about every line is a story on that song. Someday I'll tell you about the Rays, but that's a whole nother night. You have to come again if you want to hear about the Rays. <laughs> Never getting the Rays you thought you had. All right, man, what am I doing here? Ah. Thanks, everybody. You guys are so... Huh? All right, I gotta get. Uh, all right, let me let me let me do this, man. I'm sorry. I gotta do a, I gotta do a song that I wrote with a. I wrote a song with a local, sort of. <laughs> this is how much I know about California. I consider I consider this co-songwriter a local musician. Because he lives in like. <laughs> You know, north of San Francisco. <laughs> That's, you know, when you're from New York. <laughs> New York values or whatever it is. Right? Vermont, you know, we think California's like... Anyway, this is... Uh... Okay, this is a, a song that written with, uh, by uh, me and uh, Les Claypool. It's a, a song by Oysterhead. I don't know if I can pull that one off. But maybe I'll get the band. Maybe I'll get the band back together to do that one, like in, like in blues, like in the Blues Brothers. We're getting the band back together. Oysterhead. I mean, I'm, I'd do it. <laughs> because we're in Boulder, that means <laughs> means a lot to me, so much. So thank you for welcoming me back. Thank you. Thank you. The first place we used to travel, the fish, first, first time we ever went on the road. We, we went to Telluride, but we went to Boulder. So my best friend lived in town. Uh, we have some mutual friends here tonight, and, and we came to Boulder so many times, early, early, early. It was our first road trip. I'm gonna keep playing, I'm not gonna start talking too much. But um, I had this memory when I was, just very quickly, I remember driving, <laughs> sorry. The man, sorry. This isn't that, this isn't that great, it's just a stupid memory I had, but the, the man who couldn't shut up. It's like a 50s horror movie, you know? A man who could, like synthesizers and shit. The man who wouldn't shut up. Um, no, we drove out here in this weird box truck the first time. We were so excited. We were going to go to Telluride. For the, we, we met this guy somehow, and he said, you're going to do a whole Colorado tour. It was our first tour ever. We'd never left Burlington for any reason. Like, oh, my God, ever. Yeah, even to go home, it's here. But, um, you know, we, were, um, we got this 
weird little box truck. There was like a white like bread box truck. And there was like a compartment in the back of this thing and uh, no windows. It's like a two front, you know, the front seats where they drove and then like a little hole and the rest of us all sat in the back like on piles of blankets. And we had met this guy, his name was Warren Stickney. I don't want to throw Warren under the, under the bus. But um, he turned out to be kind of a, he was full of shit. <laughs> so, so I do, I kind of want to get back at Warren Stickney right now for <laughs> asshole. No, I'm sorry. Sorry, no. <laughs> but he said we'd have like seven shows, right? And we came all the way out here and we, and we found out that this guy was uh, full of it and we didn't have, we had one gig in Telluride, which was um, at, the, at the Roma um, in Telluride, if any of you guys have ever been there. Anyway, the thing that I remembered was that we had went through like all these adventures uh, on our first trip and then we ran out of money, we didn't get paid, we were like, flat, like flat broke, everybody pulled their quarters or whatever it was, and we had to make the drive back to um, Burlington. And we didn't have any food. Uh, we had like enough money set aside for gas. And we went in the grocery store, and this was the memory that I had, I was walking around this grocery store, it was like Mike and Paige and the guys in the band, and, and you know, Paul, and debating what food sustenance would get us from Colorado to and we ended to Burlington for the whole drive, and we ended up buying a turkey ham. <laughs> Do you guys know what those things even are? It's, a, it's an actual thing. I think somehow we thought that like it was two things in one. You know? <laughs> it's like turkey and ham. But anyway, then we climbed in the truck with this turkey ham and just ate it all the way back to, all the way back to Vermont. Anyway. <laughs> so let me keep playing now. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, let me do this one here, okay. Man. Hello. Oh, let me do this. One of my favorites here. Huh? Huh? <laughs> Have you had a turkey ham? <laughs> Has anyone in here ever had a turkey ham? No one's ever had a turkey ham. You guys like kale? Are you kale fans? Because I, I have to say, I did a couple of shows ago, pronounced fuck kale. I then signed to fuck kale because I was sick of kale. This is, <laughs> I was like over it, I'm like over this whole kale thing. I'm like, fuck kale. Fucking kale. Fucking kale. And then, so, that was like two shows ago. I was like, and then last night, I had the best kale salad. Like, <laughs> it was so good. I had like blackberries in it, and it was really good dressing. And I started feeling really guilty about the whole kale thing. I was so mean to kale. It's been... So then I thought, unfuck kale. I think tonight, I'm officially pronouncing, unfuck kale. Kale is back. Go kale. Unfuck kale. Make a good t-shirt. Next, next acoustic tour. That's the, that's the merchandise. Unfuck kale. <laughs> Stupidest thing I've ever heard. And another thing, by the way, I just gotta get this off my mind, because I just played in LA, I played in, right near Hollywood, and I wanted to say this and I forgot. <laughs> I just wanted to pronounce this once and for all. Shawshank Redemption is not the best movie of all time, okay? Can we just like end that one right now too? <laughs> there, okay? Unfuck Kale and Shawshank Redemption is not the best movie of all time. It's fine. It's a fine movie. <sighs> okay, wait, I'm going. Oh my God. I just, 
hold on. I just realized, I think we spelled fish wrong. Fuck. I'm so sorry. I'm straightening out. I like settling all family business tonight. We officially apologize for that mistake. I, I think it's spelled wrong. I'm so really sorry about that. Okay. Okay, we got all that out of the way. Hello. We had a... I just remembered this. But we had a... We had a monitor engineer for a while. I don't want to name, name any names or anything like that, but he was a crackhead. <laughs> <laughs> a great guy. I, I love him. But it was a problem because one night we were playing in like, I can't remember where this Pittsburgh or something or somewhere. Pittsburgh. Ah! It's been my discovery this tour. When everything is going hellaciously wrong, up here, all I have to do is yell out any town name and it gets an automatic woo. <laughs> so we must have been playing in Pittsburgh that night. Thank you. Anyway, and... <laughs> I hope I don't get in trouble for the personal things that I say. But, um... So, one of the jobs at that point in time, one of the other jobs of the monitor engineer was to put, when we walk on stage, when the band walks on stage, it's dark, it's like that, right? So they put this fluorescent yellow tape, um, and you're supposed to walk on the tape. Then sometimes there'll be a crew guy with a flashlight, but it's a reflective tape, and you walk through all these cables and stuff, and you don't fall and kill yourself. And when you're walking off stage, the same thing, because you've just been playing, your head spinning, and you, you, know, you gotta not walk off. So, I'm walking along, and, you know, um, I'm following this yellow tape, and I guess our monitor engineer at the time, um, there, he, this, there was this hole, right? <laughs> and it was a nine-foot stage, and there was this big hole in the stage. And so the thought that went through his head, which is a kind thought, was I'll cover the hole with yellow tape. <laughs> So he put like cross hatching of yellow tape over the hole, meaning don't walk here, just follow the yellow tape. But when all this yellow tape comes, don't step on it because it's a hole. <laughs> so I'm like walking along on stage and I took a step and I remember, I remember this kind of feeling like, hmm, <laughs> going down. I just, I was really curious on the way down. And I'm like, whoa. And my chin hit the, the, on the way, boom, on the, like, black, and then down the hole, and then I, like, whoosh, and like, tore all the ligaments in my ankle, like, really got messed up. And I had to go to the hospital, and they took me in a neck thing, and anyway. <laughs> Don't smoke, kids. <laughs> That's the lesson for today. Eat your kale. <laughs> On fuck kale. Come on, man. <laughs> oh, thank you. I was just starting to play this song, and I sang the first verse, but, but I'm just going to go right back there. I'm, I'm, I'm just pretending time stood still. <laughs> he asked me a question. If you guys aren't in a rush, this is a little bit of a longer, but I'm... Try this. Thank you, Michael. God, we're praying. Uh. Uh. Unfuck kale. Uh. I'm fill the time somehow. No. 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 Get that away from me. You guys know why I said that about Shawshank Redemption, right? You know why? Because every time you look at those ranker sites online, sometimes because I travel so much, you know, like I like to watch movies on the road. I like spend a lot of time just like on 
going from town to town on a bus. And uh, so, you know, I watch movies and stuff, and sometimes I'll think, oh, I wonder what I haven't seen. And I always click on all these, you know, list sites, 100 greatest movies of all time, 50 greatest movies of all time, you know, 500 movies you must see before you die. And almost inevitably, it's like number one movie of all time, Shawshank Redemption. It's like number nine, The Godfather, number eight. You know, and then I don't understand that. I didn't need to go, go back to that subject, but it pisses me off. I'll tell you one movie I did see, I did watch the other day. Did you guys ever see that movie, Still Alice? That is a disturbing movie. I just watched it. I was like, oh my God. Really. It's about early onset dementia. She gets, she can't you know, find the bathroom in her own house. It's very disturbing and very heart-wrenching. Though I must admit that I did kind of think that, I don't know if it's politically incorrect, but I was thinking like, if you, if you faked early onset dementia, <laughs> like you could get away with so much. <laughs> Am I allowed to say that? It's very... It's a funny time we live in, you know, you gotta watch what you say. <laughs> Don't wanna get in trouble. But there's this scene where, where she, she's in the hall, it's so sad. It's like she can't find the bathroom, so then she, she pees in the hall, and, and everybody's very sympathetic because she has early onset dementia. And I thought, back when I used to pee in the hall, no one was sympathetic at all. <laughs> then you fuck, I was like, I was like, if I just faked early onset dementia, I could get away with anything. I didn't remember I wasn't supposed to do that. Sorry. Do whatever the hell you want, you know? <laughs> uh, I'm gonna get in trouble with the, you know, there's gonna be the early onset dementia people are gonna, how could you say that? What, a, what an asshole, like you're insensitive. But I'll say, but I have early onset dementia, so I forgot that I wasn't supposed to say that. I'm so sorry. I can say whatever the hell I want up here now. <laughs> oh, I like it. It's a plan. This is, I've just forgot this is an encore. It's supposed to be short. <laughs> okay, I'm going to try this. This, I haven't done this in a while, so...
news story right now. I've been doing that every night. I'll just tell you one time, it's very short. I'm only going to tell you an addendum to a funny story. A couple of, a couple of tours ago, I haven't been like repeating these stories, but a couple of tours, tours ago, I told this story, true story, about this time that I was <laughs> driving down the highway outside of Burlington in my car, and um, this guy in front of me was being such an idiot, he's driving about 45 miles per hour on the highway, this long row of people, and I'm like, people are honking their horns, and I'm like, what is this guy doing? You know, he's like, going 45 on the highway, you know, nobody could get around him, and I pulled up, and I, I started to go around this guy, and I look in the window, and it was Mike. <laughs> he was writing in his journal, on the steering wheel. I'm not making this up. Going 45 miles an hour. And I'm like, Mike, Mike, you know. Anyway, the reason I tell this story is because the other fascinating thing about Mike is that he bought this car, this Volvo, like when we started the band. It was this little green Volvo, and he maintains his car better than anybody I've ever met. Anyway, he just retired his car and has like 350,000 miles on it. No kidding. It, Blows my mind. I, I'm so in awe of him. He, you know, took it to get service every time. Whoop! Wrote in his journal. Drove 45 miles an hour. <laughs> anyway, the reason I'm giving the addendum today is that Mike just bought a new car, and <laughs> he bought a Tesla, so now he can journal freely <laughs> while the car drives itself, which I think is just a great improvement for the safety of all the rest of us. But it was really fascinating to me, and the drunkenness that, you know, absolute, like, 
you know, stumbling drunkenness of these people was really adding to the experiment for me. Because <laughs> it's not like I had my phone and I'm like walking around the street and I'd walk by, you know, there'd be a certain song that would start going like, da 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 da, and like nobody would dance, even though they were shit faced. And uh, they still wouldn't dance. And then another window would be open. I couldn't really hear what the songs were, I just, because there were so many of them cross referencing. It was almost like, a, like one of those music festivals where it's just like, <laughs> and all this. And then also that C1 song start, and everybody would go, yeah! And they'd start, they'd start dancing, like the bridesmaids and everyone were dancing, and the moms. So then I would like sing these things into my phone, right? Like, that's, that's one. And that's where Cosmic Rock started. <laughs> I'm not kidding. This is what I'm saying. Am I supposed to give you secrets away? If it wasn't for Drunken Bridesmaid, there would have been no Cosmod Box. Thank you, Drunken Bridesmaids. God damn. Anyway, I keep playing. Stage. Also, who does all the Dix concerts? It's my very, very dear friend of ours and, and of mine from a long time ago. And we were talking backstage, and he was reminding me that he got his start in um, the music uh, industry when the, it was when Fish. Uh, we played a concert at the Paradise in 1989. Um, and um, Paradise is in Boston. We, we were a Burlington band, and we were trying really hard to get, uh, it was very hard to get out of Vermont and to kind of convince people that, you know, it was worth booking the band and all that stuff. And um, we did a show that was a real turning point where we played down at this premier club down in, in Boston called the Paradise, and all these people came from all around, friends of ours. Like, Fish was always like a, like a community from, from the first day, the first show we ever did. It was, <laughs> So we played this gig at the Paradise, and everybody just came from all over. It like, wasn't like a Boston crowd. It was like, Don was there, he was reminding me, and, and after that, he got interested in, in booking shows and putting on shows, and he's been booking the show, he did Dix, he's been, we've been working together, started the Fox Theater and all that. But he, he was saying backstage that that show was like the beginning, and it reminded me uh, that it was in 1989, um, and that was a real special year. So, after being on the road for three weeks, I go, I go home tomorrow morning and I see my wife, Sue, and I'm very excited. So, this is also about that year. Seeking a memory dear to the heart You're finally weightless 
So take to the sky, Sigma Oasis is sailing on by. Our ligaments falter, we scatter like art. The furrows assembled, what tides pulled apart. The work on the bone fragments, jigs on me cease. Sigma Oasis holds the last piece. Oh, 